Can you see it? Yep, there it is. Uh, yes, there it is. Perfect. Good. Okay, so Live on Instagram. We, can, we can start. Can, Please. can everybody hear us okay? Is the connection okay? Okay, yes, perfect. All right, well, welcome everyone to the first Instagram Live of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston series called uh, Coffee with a Curator. Let me introduce myself. My name is Mariana Cano. I'm a Houston lifestyle bilingual blogger. The name of my blog is Yo Mariana. And it's truly an honor for me to be sharing today the screen with the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the city's most important art institution. So thank you so much. And um, I hope everyone is home and safe and in an effort from the museum to share with you the wonderful exhibition, Glory of Spain, we're bringing you home today a behind the scenes conversation with James Sano. James is a European art curator of the museum. Hi, James. How Mariana, hi, good, how are you doing? Thank you for good. chatting with me today. It's great to be here with you and to be sharing a cup of coffee. <laughs> Indeed, cheers, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, just a quick reminder for everybody to please send us your questions and your comments. We'll be reading them at the end of our conversation, so please stay with us. And uh, before we jump right into the exhibition, Glory of Spain, I would love to know, James, how do you discover your passion for art? How do you start your career as a curator? And how long have you been working with the Museum of Fine Arts? Oh, thank you. Uh, great question. Uh, you know, my, my path towards being an art historian and a curator hasn't been just a direct trajectory. Um, as an undergraduate, I earned my undergraduate degree in biochemistry. And I was going to go a certain direction with that. And then my last semester of undergraduate studies, I took two art history courses and was struck by lightning. Uh, that coupled with some travel in Europe uh, during college prior to that, it was clear to me that uh, a new pathway had opened up, a new line of inquiry that studying art provided that I had been hitherto unaware of and decided to just jump straight in. And so uh, Upon discovering art history through classes and through looking at beautiful things in Europe, I decided after I graduated and got married all in one, <laughs> all in one step that we moved to Houston. My wife had a great job there and I decided to take the leap. So I applied to a bunch of different jobs in museums, none of which I was qualified for, of course, with a biochemistry degree. <laughs> and I ended up accepting a position here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston as a security guard. And so I worked for a little less than a year as a security guard and a month or two in, I became a supervisor. And I wear that experience as a badge of honor, just in terms of getting my feet wet and gaining more wherewithal within the museum environment. After that, I went to graduate school and followed the typical track, graduate school, research fellowships, internships, and eventually ended up in Naples, Italy, where I worked as a curator Oh, wow. Uh, for a few years, which is where I was just prior to coming to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston as an associate curator of European art. And I arrived in September 2019. So that's it in a, in a nutshell. No, super, super interesting. Thank you so much for sharing with us that. And so let's jump right into the exhibition, Glory of Spain, Treasures from the Hispanic Society and Library. Um, uh, the exhibition is presenting 220 artworks that span 4,000 years of Hispanic art and culture. Um, what are some of the challenges that you encountered as a curator, figuring out what was the best way to present this exhibition, given its large size and super broad chronological scope? Great question again. These are, these are questions that curators have to answer for themselves when they stage an exhibition. Uh, I would say that given that this is a touring exhibition and museum has the place of honor as being the final uh, venue, uh, Houston does, uh, I was thinking about how do I wrangle this material, particularly across a broad chronological range, 4,000 years, as you mentioned, as well as se several hundred objects 
And it dawned on me, particularly being able to travel to the Cincinnati Art Museum where the exhibition was prior to coming to us. I was one, able to see these objects in the flesh and get a sense of what it would take to install them in a compelling manner in Houston, uh, as well as realizing that our specific exhibition space in the Upper Brown Pavilion in the law building at the museum uh, provided certain opportunities in terms of how to present these objects. Uh, two things stood out about that. One is that we have very high ceilings and high walls in the Upper Brown Pavilion. And we also have uh, quite, quite a bit of unimpeded open floor space. Mm -hmm. And so this was a cue for me to, to, for, for our iteration of Glory of Spain to be as excellent as it can be to really take into account the nature and shape of our space. And so I, you know, dug into that and tried to put as many three-dimensional objects, which there are many, silverwork, sculpture, uh, et cetera, textiles, uh, liturgical vestments out into the floor so that people can walk around these objects and see them in the round. And so th that's a few of the things that I was thinking about as, as meeting this challenge of curating the exhibition here in Houston. Right, and I think all of this dimension is what makes it so unique for this specific presentation in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, right? I, I hope so. Yeah, I, that's the idea. You know, of course, that's that's for my colleagues and the public uh, to weigh in on, of course. But that was certainly the impetus. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So, um, I was um, so impressed by the wonderful artworks that um, the exhibition is presenting, but. Um, there were three that really caught my attention. Um, I was really impressed to see the only surviving intact Alhambra silk textile. That right. is huge. And then all the metalwork for the Antiquity of Spain that dates for 100 BC. Yeah. And of course, the star of the show, the portrait of the Duchess of Alba from Francisco de Goya. Right. So, I'm curious to know, which ones are your favorites and which ones were you most impressed by this exhibition? Wow, you know, that's, that's tough because uh, the Hispanic Society uh, Museum and Library in New York, in Manhattan, here in the U.S., has such a rich and diverse collection. We're getting the very best examples across their collection for this exhibition. So you're seeing artworks in, in Glory of Spain that are the best examples of their kind, whatever medium or uh, chronological period that they come from. So saying that, you know, picking a favorite or a few favorites is kind of like picking a favorite child if you have children. <laughs> right. But there's, a, there, there's certainly a few that have really struck me. Uh, I, I really like our liturgical objects. We have a chalice, early 15th, excuse me, 16th century chalice from Segovia, which would, is uh, gilt silver. And it would have been used during serving uh, communion within the Roman Catholic rite of the mass. And its, its physical properties, its, its splendor as an object, as the light strikes it, seeing light radiating off of it is something that from a purely aesthetic point of view, I'm always struck by every time I walk by it. Uh, I'd also say as well, um, we have a beautiful portrait by arguably uh, the greatest Spanish painter to ever live and of course I say arguably because no one arguably. yeah no one can agree on that but Diego Velasquez a, a crucially important painter of the 17th century golden age period of Spain uh, painted a portrait of a churchman Camilo Ostali also known as Cardinal Pamphili and I really feel like you know Velasquez is hitting on all eight cylinders in this portrait He's, he's touted for being, being able to draw out kind of a psychological presence in the person that he's painting in order to, to indicate some inner state of their soul or personality. And I think he very much uh, pulls that off in this portrait of Camilo Ostley from circa 1650. And I do have to mention one of the reasons too, it's one of my favorites is that that painting is an MFAH exclusive. So we're the only museum to have received uh, this painting from the Hispanic Society. So we're uh, thrilled and proud about that. Oh, yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. And then um, 
could you describe for us what are the phases of the creation of an exhibition? I always wonder mm. about the creator, what of these phases do you find the most rewarding? Right. Well, this is like several of the other questions you've asked. These are kind of behind the scenes questions, things that we deal with within the museum. And I think the right place to start here in answering that question regarding the phases of an exhibition is first to acknowledge that stage, staging any exhibition, but certainly an exhibition of the size and scope of Glory of Spain is utterly a collaborative uh, endeavor. So most of, most nearly all of the departments in the museum, we have over 600 employees in the museum. Most departments in the museum and, you know, provide their expertise uh, for staging an exhibition. Uh, so, the, I mean, the first thing starts with getting the exhibition to your venue. And mm -hmm. we have to thank for that our director, Gary Tintero, as well as our associate director and head of exhibitions, Deborah Roldan, uh, for, mm -hmm. for clinching uh, this exhibition for Houston. From there, there's a lot of planning. Uh, you work with various departments to, to decide how you're going to lay out the exhibition. You have to have people to install the exhibition, to unpack the artworks as they come into the museum, yeah. uh, to check them to make sure they weren't damaged in transit, which would mm -hmm. be conservators. And then uh, you do the, the installation itself where you put things on the wall and you put things in cases. And so typically, you know, this is, this is a process that could last anywhere from six months on the short end, you know, to a couple of years potentially. Um, so the front end work before the show opens is really, for me, where a lot of the art historical magic occurs because you're determining how is the show going to look and what type of stories am I going to tell with the objects that we have. Process after that, of course, is getting able to, uh, having the ability to enjoy it with the public and people, you know, come and see it and doing interviews like this with you, which is wonderful. So those, those, are, those are some of the phases involved in staging the exhibition. It's super interesting, super interesting. I can only imagine the challenge specifically with this exhibition. So um, how is this exhibition, Glory of Spain, relevant to our culture today in 2020? That's a great, that's another great question. You know, as a museum, we bring a certain expertise as any professional does in their environment. Ours happens to be art, at least speaking for curators. And we want to stage exhibitions that are not only interesting to our public, which is highly diverse, um, but also pr provides an opportunity to learn something new and to encounter yourself in that process by engaging with these artworks. We know today, you know, our, our culture, our society in America is, is vastly diverse. We know also that it's said now that Houston is one of the most diverse city in the country and soon, you know, to surpass Chicago, I think, in population. So we're really in a, in a key place within this country and the world in terms of engaging our audience. So in terms of relevant, relevance, you know, Glory of Spain with artworks from Spain, as well as from Mexico, Central and South America, uh, strikes a chord with the history of this state, the history of Texas, and the sizable and important uh, communities that we have here from those parts of the world. Uh, the, the beauty about this exhibition is that it has something to offer everyone. If you like European art, you can do that. If you like antiquities, if you like jewelry, if you like painting you know, from 18th century Mexico City, you can do that too. And so we feel like you know, this exhibition reflects the complexity and richness um, of our society today. And so we think that, you know, strikes a chord with uh, what we're trying to accomplish as an institution. And we, we think it's highly relevant for that reason. Right, so I think this is exactly um, how would I, I would assume it fulfills the museum, the museum's mission, right? Right, right. It wants me to everybody um, an exhibition of a scope like, like this one. Yeah, it is, you know, our mission Museums have, there's been a radical shift that's occurred in museums in general over the last 50 or 60 years, mm -hmm. where previously they were really places for scholarship and specialists, almost like a research library. Today, they're very much more uh, community centers 
And this is the way our, our uh, similar to the way our director, Gary Tintero, understands, you know, his role in, in leading the institution. It's a specific type of community center, right? It's, it's a place for intellectual engagement, for existential inquiry and sustainment. Uh, but nonetheless, it has to be a place we feel for all people. And we like our exhibitions to reflect that reality, that you can come in off the street, not know anything about art, little about history, and still come in and have, you know, the opportunity for, for uh, a very rich engagement that will fortify you, you know, as you move forward in your, your daily life. And again, Glory of Spain, we feel like certainly meets that mark. It, it offers that to our public and we're thrilled uh, to have had the opportunity to, to give this to our community and the broader world. Yes, absolutely, I agree. So uh, let me see if I can read some of the questions and comments Please. that we have here from people watching. I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> uh, let me see. Um, okay. Um, they are asking, James, what is your favorite part of the exhibit? What's my favorite part of the exhibit? You know, probably for me, my, my specialty as an art historian is Italian Renaissance and Baroque art. And we have a section within the exhibition uh, entitled Golden Age Spain, where our paintings by El Greco, uh, who was an important painter uh, in the 16th and early 17th century, our Velasquez is in there, other uh, incredibly eminent Spanish Baroque painters, Zerberon, Cano, Murillo, uh, this is probably my favorite section because it resonates uh, with an area of history and art that I've spent a lot of time in, uh, in on the Italian side of things. And given the kind of international uh, scope and influence of Italian art during that time and its interaction with Spanish art uh, as well from the Iberian Peninsula, I find this to be a really exhilarating passage within the exhibition. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Then another one is, um, it says, James, is there a Francis Bacon connection to this exhibition? What a great question. You know, uh, my colleague, curatorial colleague, um, Alison DeLima Green, who's our curator of modern and contemporary art, uh, just opened a F Francis Bacon uh, late paintings exhibition. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a relevant question. We had that exhibition on view uh, most recently. Uh, Bacon, of course, is a, is a modern artist. We have modern artists in the Glory of Spain exhibition, but Bacon is not one of them. However, Francis Bacon painted uh, a portrait, uh, mm -hmm. really copied, interpreted a portrait by Velazquez of Pope Innocent X, 17th century Pope, which is one of Velas Velasquez's portraits, one of the most famous portraits uh, in the world. And Bacon interpreted that painting by Velasquez kind of from his own conception. And it's a quite eerie and startling portrait indeed that, that Bacon produced. So we can say art historically that Francis Bacon <clears throat> had a great knowledge of the old masters engaged with Velasquez and this portrait that he uh, painted of of Pope Innocent X, who was the uncle of Camilo Ostoli, the portrait that I just mentioned, that's one of my favorites. So there are, there are some connections there, but we don't have Bacon works in the exhibition. Um, I have people here from Mexico encouraging you to visit Puebla, the museum of the Museo del Barroco. I wonder uh, if you've ever visited. I haven't, I haven't. I haven't dipped further south than um, uh, Matamoros. So I know that's in the north. And I, I haven't dipped down there yet. I know that, you know, Mexico and Mexico City, which we have represented well in the exhibition, maps uh, works from artists who work there. It's an incredibly rich city culturally, architecturally, artistically. Mm -hmm. And so certainly, perhaps not unlike uh, the founder of the Hispanic Society, Archer Huntington, and his visits to Mexico and Spain that encouraged him to collect art in these areas, now having curated an exhibition from, from the collection that he in part built, uh, it spurred me to at the nearest chance, uh, get down there, absolutely. 
Yeah, that would be great. Um, I'm reading here that we have people from Lyon, France, from Orlando, from Mexico City, Wonderful. from Houston, from Las Vegas. Even my father-in-law is watching. Ah, he's, wonderful. He's yeah. one of the most well-read people I know. Uh -huh. So this is really exciting. Here's another question. Um, are there female artists on this exhibition? There is. We have, we have, I'd say, to my mind, perhaps the most prominent 17th century sculptor, uh, Luisa Roldana. And she is one of the preeminent sculptors of the 17th century period. Uh, she's not well known. And we know that uh, in the early modern period, 17th century, for instance, uh, there were very few women artists. Uh, mm -hmm. However, for our exhibition, we have a very uh, uh, small terra terracotta sculpture of the mystical marriage of St. Catherine. Uh, impeccably executed. It's a real showstopper and jewel when you see it. So this would be an example uh, of a woman artist in the exhibition that's represented uh, of a work at the highest caliber and an artist at the highest caliber. Right. Um, I'm also reading comments. Hi to Brazil also. Hi. And um, what uh, people are wondering, what kind of work uh, for artworks can we find? So if you can give us just a little bit more detailed description of the, of the exhibition. Yes. Well, you know, this to me is, is a remarkable ex exhibition in part because of the great diversity of media that we have represented. Right. So the types of artworks, if you want to talk about media, uh, we have stone sculpture, we have uh, jewelry of precious metals, we have earthenware, we have paintings, we have textiles, we have metalwork, we have etchings, drawings, books, maps, I and mean, we can go down a, a very long list. This, this is an extremely, you know, wooden polychrome sculpture, wooden sculpture painted with many colors. Uh, this is a remarkable exhibition because it, it nearly represents all of the major media that artists have been working uh, through and on throughout the ages. I mean, so in that sense, again, it's got something for everybody. Very rich, very complex. Wow. Here's another super interesting question. It says, um, as a curator, how do you judge a piece for a gallery? Have you ever been refused a piece? Uh, in what sense? Do you mean if for an exhibition or if? I if guess a... for an exhibition, exactly. Well, you know, we have... Uh, Museums across the world, particularly prominent museums like the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, have relationships with other institutions across the globe. And we uh, continually and frequently loan our, our artworks to them. Mm -hmm. And we also request artworks uh, from our colleagues in other institutions. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, typically, if an institution can loan something, they, they will loan something to us. If there was ever a case, you know, to where, let's just speak personally, if I was doing an exhibition and I wanted a particular work and for whatever reason wasn't able to get it, normally that's because there's a scheduling conflict with that artwork. It might be going to another exhibition at the same time I want to have mine, etc. Conservation is issues also factor in if, if the artwork isn't stable enough materially to travel. Right. particularly travel long distances, well, then, you know, you won't be able to uh, have a successful loan request. But in general, I would say, you know, we have, we have excellent relationships with our uh, partner institutions and peer institutions across the world and have an extremely high rate of success uh, when we do request an artwork from another institution. Okay. Yeah. Then, here's another question. Um, James, what's your take on abstract art? My take on abstract art. Great question. Again, you know, I, I would say that there's so, and this is, this is why I, I got into art history. There is no line of inquiry that is interesting to the human mind, if you will, and heart that can't be pursued by looking at and studying art. All human concerns are represented in the objects that other human beings have produced over time. And so abstract art uh, is, is, you know, a passage, a style in the history of art 
uh, primarily we think of the early 20th century moving forward with people like Picasso, Brock, Matisse, etc., uh, who kind of uh, pioneered this new style. Uh, I, th I tend to think of things first drawn from my own experience and expertise. You know, I have studied antiquity through the Renaissance and Baroque period most intensely. And so when I look at abstract art, I see the dialogue that's occurring between the modern artists who pioneer this new style of abstraction mm -hmm. in relationship and dialogue to the canon and the, the, the previously received rules, if you will, for producing art. And I really mm -hmm. like to suss out these very, I would say, considered highly intelligent breaks uh, that abstract, abstract art makes with uh, the tradition of European painting, at least in this case. And so when I you know, engage with abstract art, I first start from there. I, I suss out what exactly is this artist doing in response to all of the art that has come before them. Right. Abstract art or any other kind of art, to me, it comes down to individual objects. And individual objects, when you encounter them in the flesh, can uh, you know repulse you you can immediately fall in love with them but as you continue to think and look at them discover that there's not as much depth there as you might have thought but it's often the the opposite case as well something that you don't like uh, can often turn into something that you appreciate the most because there's something to discover there that you don't immediately recognize and in this I would say the process of looking and thinking through art is not in some sense is dissimilar from writing, uh, excuse, excuse me, from reading a great novel. Right. You know, it takes time. You have to reflect. It's optimal if you can come back over and over again and, and engage with it. And as you change and your perspective change as a person, your perception of the object can also change. So in that sense, to me, abstract art, you know, offers as much richness and depth as any other period of art, although the mode of engagement uh, might be different for me. Totally. I totally yeah. agree. Every time I visit a, a museum, even though I've been to that museum before, it's a totally different experience. The way right. you encounter with art is the one, the way you, you experience that that moment. Um, I was reading for another question. Do you know if there's going to be a book of this exhibition, Glory of Spain, that maybe people can purchase? There. Well, luckily there already is. There's a catalog for this exhibition. Uh, the catalog has all of the artworks that we have in the exhibition are in the catalog with the exception of a few works uh, that we requested from the Hispanic Society in addition to what was already coming to us. Um, oh, that's great. Yeah, that book is called Treasures from the Hispanic Society Museum and Library. It's in print. It can be found online. And uh, we had uh, also have some in the museum but at this point it's it's best to search for them online i would say online. yeah that's awesome in fact yeah. let me show you a picture of the catalog sure oh, Where is it right here? we have goya's duchess of alba on the front so take a screenshot anyone who's interested and you can look this up online definitely um, yeah. I'll, I'll add the link to that um, on my on my social media as well. And um, another question for you, James, um, what do you want people to get out of this exhibition? Mm. That's a, you know, that's a more difficult question to answer, perhaps, because, you know, engaging with art, as we've been discussing, there are universals that Base, uh, reactions that we tend to have as, as humans to other artworks and objects that humans have made. But often, too, there's a very individual relationship that can be struck when you're looking at things yourself. So having said that, uh, there are a few things I'd like people to take away. One, to appreciate the imminent and expansive influence that Spain and its culture that it gave back, let's say, in the 16th century as it came to this part of the world, just how prominent, influential, profound uh, that influence is. And you can see, you know, again, across this great chronological span, uh, the immense contributions that Spain has made to world art. 
Following that, it's also true, Mexico, Central, South America, which we also have represented in the exhibition, do the exact same thing. So drawing back, all of the artworks that we have in this exhibition are, are some of the best examples of that object type. Uh, I would also like people just to enjoy being in the space. I mean, that's one of the great things about going to a museum. They're, they're special places. You know, they're a place of engagement, connecting with people, but also a place that you can find quiet, respite, you can reflect as you're engaging with the artworks. And I hope that the installation uh, that we've put together uh, uh, reflects that, the balance, harmony, and the aesthetic quality that we went for. Uh, I hope that's something that they can take away. Well, uh, well, just an enjoyable encounter. Right. Do you know if the museum has any um, any of these artists' um, artworks as, as part of their permanent collection? Yeah, we do. I'll, I'll name two uh, just for good measure. First, Francisco de Goya, one of the major artists in the exhibition. We have over 100 works on paper by okay. Goya. Uh, Goya was prolific working in paper and one of the most important uh, graphic artists, if you will, in the history of art. We have over a hundred of his works uh, on paper, both from the Follies series, a famous series of works on paper that he made, as well as the Dis Disasters of War, which is the most famous, perhaps, of his <laughs> output. We also have a painting uh, by Goya, which is a still life uh, with fish, with sea bream. I believe it's an oil painting. It's on view in the galleries. And we, we as well have a, a painting attributed to Diego Velasquez, another great name called The Kitchen Maid, uh, which okay. can both paintings, the Goya and the Velasquez, can be seen on the second floor of the back building at the museum in the European art galleries. That's amazing. Yeah. That's wonderful. And um, I have here another question. Um, does the exhibition address the history of colonialism? Uh, excuse me, could you repeat does, that? It says here, um, does the exhibition address the history of colonialism? It does, it does as a historical fact. Uh, these are things that have happened and it's up to us, and this is another reason why this exhibition is relevant in 2020. It's up to us to peer into our collective histories, to understand what happened and to reflect on it. Um, these artworks provide that opportunity. Uh, mm -hmm. The section that we have in the exhibition with art from the Americas is called the Spanish Americas. We selected this title because it's at once descriptive, but relatively apolitical. This is a period where, you know, Spanish conquistadors had come to, to the New World, as it's been called in the past, and mm -hmm. artists were trained in the European tradition. And so you can see uh, in this exhibition the impact of that interchange of peoples. It's a very real thing that happened. Uh, beautiful artworks uh, came from it that you'll see in this exhibition, but absolutely, you know, we don't shy away from history as a, just an objective subject, you know? And so absolutely this, this, this exhibition also deals with those very crucial issues. Right, I'm, I'm so happy to be reading so many questions from everybody. And um, here's another one for you as a curator. They're asking, what do you think is the best way to study art history? Mm. Engaging with art is not, on the first level, I would say an abstract exercise. It's engagement with physical objects. Right. So I would always anchor any study with going in person and looking at objects in the flesh, first of all. And that, that will ground whatever you're studying in books. You need to have visual engagement, personal engagement with the things that you're studying. Like many other subjects though, as you start out studying art history, uh, you, you typically begin with uh, memorization exercises to learn the different period styles, the major artists, kind of a chronological flow of art as we understand it through the ages. And that, that trains your eye a little bit to start recognizing what it is that you're seeing wherever you encounter it. That would be the first step. But of course, books are great. And that always has to be coupled, coupled with looking in person. That's what I would say. 
Right. Perfect. And then people are wondering, what are your favorite books that I think they're looking at your shelf? Ah. They're wondering, what are your favorite books? My favorite books. It's interesting, you know, as, as an art historian and a curator, when I read on my own time, not doing research for mm -hmm. a particular project, I don't, I, I usually read something like philosophy, theology, or just history proper, which is interesting. Maybe that's a respite, you know, from the discipline. Within the discipline of art history, one of my uh, favorite art historians who's exercised uh, a great deal of influence over my intellectual imagination would be Leo Steinberg, uh, who recently passed uh, in the mm -hmm. 21st century. One of the great uh, immigre art historians who came to America in, in, as a result of World War II. Most specifically, uh, being studying the Italian Renaissance, he wrote a book called uh, Leonardo's Incessant Last Supper, which is a tongue twister and a difficult title. It's about Leonardo da Vinci's la famous Last Supper fresco. Excellent book, perhaps the greatest meditation on a single work of art that's ever been produced, it's book length. And I'd also recommend from Steinberg a collection of essays called Other Criteria, uh, which will clue you in uh, to his mode of thinking and some of the broad currents that have taken place uh, within the 20th century in terms of the development of the discipline of art history itself and his reflections upon that. Okay, wonderful. And I have here, I think our last question. Great. This is really funny. What's painted on your coffee mug? People are wondering. <laughs> My coffee mug. Yes, this is a cup from uh, Palestine. My wife grew up in that part of the world. And as a wedding gift, this is one of the things that we got. So it's a, just a floral, hand-painted floral motif that we've had for a number of years now. And it's, it's my favorite cup. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much, James, for this incredible conversation. I hope to meet you in person at the museum very soon. Absolutely. And, um, for all of you watching, I send you all of my best wishes. We can do this. Stay home, stay safe. And please follow the museum on Instagram. It's at MFA Houston. And also you can follow my blog at Yo Mariana blog. And I uh, hope to do this again soon. Thank Mariana, you. thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. I hope we're able to do it uh, again as well. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for everyone for watching us and your interest, both in Yo Mariana's uh, work, as well as our work at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Thank you so much. Thank you, James. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Bye.